fails in more Final Fours than any coach in men's basketball, his record is unparalleled. Let's take a look. Welcome to the stage, Coach K. Wow, uh, I just came from Las Vegas, so I feel like a showgirl. <laughs> not really, uh, not really. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Of the last three days have been unbelievable for you. And uh, 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 Dykema has given me a, an opportunity uh, to talk to a great team. Uh, in the last week, I've been really fortunate. Last Friday at this time, I was speaking, I had a, a, the honor of speaking to our U.S. Olympic swimming team uh, in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. These were 50 of the top athletes in our, in our country. And I get chills thinking about it. There's, there's Katie Ledecky in the, in the audience and all these wonderful young men and women. And uh, uh, when you think of your business and competition, in their competition, a, f a tenth of a second means you win or lose. And in order to be that 50, uh, they had a thousand swimmers in Indianapolis vying for these 50 spots. Uh, amazing competition. And so that was an honor. And then for the last couple of days, I've been in Las Vegas. You think it's hot here. Uh, yeah, uh, actually flying in here last night, our plane couldn't take off until the temperature got just below 115. Crazy, right? So I was a little bit nervous. It shouldn't be 111, and uh, I mean, what the hell happens, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, but I was with our U.S. Olympic basketball team. I had a chance uh, in my career. I've been the luckiest guy in the world to coach at Duke, West Point, my alma mater, and uh, and the 11 years I coached the U.S. team, it's been amazing. And then I get a chance to talk to all of you. It's a hell of a week. Yeah. <laughs> three unbelievably winning teams. And uh, you know, you all share, the three groups share one, one thing in common. Nothing against you, it's not athletic ability, all right? So just, uh, it's not athletic ability, especially with Brian, all right? Uh, yeah, Brian is the perfect example of the guy who didn't make the team. Uh, go be a lawyer, you want to be a manager? Uh, 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 so, not, I'm not dissing you, but uh, that's not how you have it in common, all right? What you have in common is that all three teams uh, are put together. Uh, you're trying to put them together, but you're, uh, you're, you're preparing to win. Like, for me, I've been an anal preparer to win. Yeah, everybody wants to win. You say, yeah, we're going to win, we're going to win. Unless you're an idiot, right? Like, yeah, I want to lose. Yeah, I, I, it's okay if I lose. 
And so you want to win. But what really makes a champion uh, is the preparation to win and doing it over and over again, where you don't just win once, but you win over a period of time. You know, I coached for five decades, and in each of those decades, my due team at some time was number one in the country. And so I, I knew the value of preparation, and I learned that a lot at West Point, and when I was an Army officer for five years. And so the preparation to win, but what I'd like to share with you, because all of you are leaders, is something about leadership, you know, how you can be a be uh, better leaders, really some good fundamental stuff. But it, it's not just the leading, it's how you, uh, how you produce an environment to win that's conducive for winning. That's part of leadership. And that environment should be successful in Sunny days, partly cloudy days, and really cloudy days. I know some of the days that are happening in your in industry, the sun doesn't shine all the time. You know, there's these storms of interest rates that create hurricanes and tropical storms and, and whatever. But you know what? You still have to you still have to handle that. Yeah. And so for me, I've studied leadership my whole life. I went to the best school in the world for leadership, the United States Military Academy. Are there any Navy guys in the audience? Yeah, yeah they wouldn't show up. To, uh, yeah, they wouldn't show up. And, uh, and then being an officer, but I've studied leadership my whole life uh, and continue to study it. It's an ongoing study. I still work at Duke, have a lifetime contract. Uh, still, I speak all over. I have a radio show on Sirius, but I'm, I'm a professor at our Fugue School of Business. Man, my buddies in Chicago, that's where I'm from, would have never imagined me being a professor. And I, 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 I speak on leadership and teamwork. And so the thing that I came up with that is pretty easy to understand about four or five months ago. I call it the three A's of leadership. Yeah. Every leader should do these three A's. And when you do them, your team will also end up doing the three A's. All right? The first A is agility. Uh, I don't know if you watch me come back on stage or walking around. My agility is not that good physically. Okay, I have two artificial hips two artificial knees, and six months ago, I had a, uh, uh, an in-bone ankle replacement and a foot realignment, all right? Uh, I only have one body part that hasn't been, that's mine, my ankle. You know, my wife tells me, why don't you check on your head? And uh, you know, the lobotomy sounds good for you, so I'm not, We've been married 55 years, so she could say that in a way when we got married on graduation day at West Point. We have three daughters, 10 grandkids. You know, all of them live within 10 minutes of us. Pretty cool, right? Uh, my three daughters, my wife and I, you talked about a team. After this is over, I'll head off uh, to catch a plane back to Las Vegas. And I'll look, and we have a group text called the Starting Five. Yeah, it's a cool thing, like we're, we're solid, yeah. we're, we're solid. But when you're, when you're thinking of, of agility, it's not the physical agility, it's the agility to handle any situation quickly and adjust. Like if I'm a quarterback and I'm gonna come to the line and we're gonna run a play, but I see something where the play is not gonna work, so I call it audible, agility. I'm a guard, bringing the ball down the court. And I'm supposed to run a play, but I see something more opportunistic. And I go to that. So the agility of a leader and the agility of a team is huge. Huge. But you can't have the agility to the level that it needs to be without the second A. And the second A is adaptability. And it's not just adapting uh, to the current uh, financial 
uh, situation that you're in. It's, a, it, it's really adapting to how you communicate as you move along. Like, uh, God was really, has been really good to me. I'm 77, and I've lived a life that I dreamed of, of more than I dreamed of, of living. Uh, but the adaptability, he pulled a trick on me. Uh, I got older, and the kids I coached stayed the same age. It's a dirty trick, uh, really a dirty trick. They're always 18 to 22, and I'm 40, 50, 60, 70, whoa. And so I had to adapt communication-wise 15 times, you know. Uh, you have to, what's the current music, the lingo, what language, you know, stuff like that. Uh, you have to dress, you couldn't dress like what you dressed like 10 years ago. So I got a good Nike contract, so I don't dress like a player because then you'd look foolish, all right? They look good in what they wear. You would not look good in, in what with them. You might, but I wouldn't. And so, uh, but I would try to speak their, and speak their language. Uh, and I ended up staying young because I always had to be in their world. And as a leader, it's important to be in the world of your team, not just to be in your world, right? That's a responsibility that you have. And in adaptability, uh, there are two, I call them force multiplier things that you can do that don't cost any money. Pretty good, Brian, you don't have to spend any more money. Uh, uh, there are two questions that you can ask your team members. And I've done this with all my teams. You know, I'll say, you know, I know your husband, I know your kids, I know your birthday, that's cool, right? So you feel good about that. But what if we're involved in something and I come up to you and I say, what do you think about this? How do you feel about this? Right away, what happens, it goes from listening to right here, right? You feel empowered. You feel like you're a part of something. It's an easy thing to do. You know, in Beijing, before our 2008 Olympics, in, in every practice, I would meet with Kobe Bryant and LeBron James and always have a practice plan. I'd, what do you think? How do you feel about this? And they might say, Coach, I don't think that's good, or why don't we add this, or whatever. And one, I got intel right away right away. I didn't have to send out surveys or anything like that or, you know, uh, all this kind of crap we do. Uh, that, it's good crap, but this is better. This is better stuff. And because it's current. And so then when we walked out on the court for practice, it was ours. You know, okay? And I was current in what I, in what I was doing. How do you feel about something? What do you think? It helps you be more agile. If I'm in a practice and I don't know that, and something's happening and I find out about it, well then I'm solving a problem. What if we could anticipate a problem and never have it? Pretty cool, you know, pretty cool. Yeah. And so agility and adaptability are, are huge. They don't mean a darn thing if you don't have the third A. And the third A is accountability. Wow. That's an endangered species. Uh, people don't like to hold the, each other accountable. Uh, they don't like to confront. Now, to me, confrontation is meeting the truth head on. If I have something to say to you, it's the truth, okay? You know, whenever we recruited, I would tell a kid that I'm recruiting, I'm gonna, I'm going to be one of the three to five people in your life that will always tell you the truth. I promise. So I do do something, and I'll do it with Brian. So I might as well pick on him again, right? And uh, so um, you're now, imagine yourself being a really good basketball player. All right? <laughs> you're a foot taller, by the way, or else you're a foot taller. And I'm in your house, and I say, hey, Brian. That's a great suit. Yeah. 
that shirt, that's unbelievable. You know, you don't believe them. You, you know what, though, your shoes suck, you know? And, uh, and the kid would look, I said, no, your shoes don't suck. But uh, there's gonna be moments at a timeout or in a situation where I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Sometimes it's gonna be you're playing great, Another time it might be, you know, you better get your head out of a part of your body, you know, and start playing. And uh, and you got to handle that the right way where it's not personal, okay? So uh, my middle daughter, Lindy, is a dean of students at Durham Academy, Durham, where we live. And uh, this is crazy. This spring, Jimmy, one of the kids that uh, got a C, in a course. And Jimmy and his mother come in to see Wendy and the teacher, and they have a meeting. And Jimmy's mom says, how can Jimmy get a C? What are you doing? You know, can't you all do your job better? And whatever. And my daughter, you know, she's grown up in a coach's life. She looks at this lady and says, Jimmy's mom, I won't say the name, Jimmy's mom, you know what? Jimmy took the test. Jimmy got the C. Yeah. If Jimmy wants to get a B or an A, we're there for him. But if he doesn't take responsibility for the C, he'll never do it. And by the way, he'll never develop his potential because part of developing your potential is failure and handling failure, handling adverse situations. And so the situation that you may be in, in an environment, and I say, whoa, 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 you know, there's an opportunity if, if it's handled the right way of growing together. So you got agility, adaptability, and accountability. Okay, it's tough for accountability. The toughest accountability situation I've ever been in was, again, in the big Beijing Olympics. And it, it happened with, at that time, and really in all time, as good a player as, as ever played basketball, Kobe Bryant. I coached him twice and we were very close and this is terrible. And so we're in Shanghai uh, playing our last exhibition game before going to Beijing. And we're playing Australia. And we're agile, adaptable, we're doing, yeah, we're, we're good. Like we're really damn good. And during the game, Kobe started taking Laker shots, not U.S. shots. N nothing against the Lakers right now. It's just with LeBron and no despair. They were crappy shots. They were bad shots. Okay? So he's taking those shots, and I'm sitting on the bench, and LeBron James is on the court. And LeBron, I'm gonna, there's going to be a mutiny right now. And so LeBron looks at me. And I look at him and I said, don't do anything. I'll take care of this. And LeBron, at his level, he's a guy that will always give you a second look. So then he looks again, like, you're sure? I said, I promise you I'll take care of it. So that night, we end up winning the game, but you could already tell we're not the same. It, it doesn't take much not to be the same. Being the same takes a lot, all right? Being not the same, it's easy. You know, that's what losers do. They, they don't stay the same. They don't stay the same. Those are the teams you want to play against. So I stay up all night with my staff. I'm going to have to hold the best player in the world accountable. So I'm nervous about it. Like, how do I do it? So the next morning comes, and I see Kobe. I said, Kobe, I need... I need to meet with you. I said, of course. So we go in the meeting room, and I have all the shots on tape. And I, I said to him, and he's got these piercing eyes. He's just such a beautiful, great player. And uh, he's looking at me. I said, yesterday you took really bad shots. If you take those shots, okay, we will not only not win the gold, we won't win a medal, we will not be a team. And so I showed him the shots and said, you can't take those shots. Now here's the moment of truth, right? So he looks at me and I'm, 
really nervous. You know, I'm really nervous. I'm, is this going to be World War III or whatever? And he looks at me and he says, okay. And my heart dropped. You can't show that, by the way. My heart dropped. I said, I stayed up all night for okay. And, and so I said again, I was a little bit like LeBron, are you sure? Yeah, you, know, you sure? And he says, Coach, I won't take those shots. Fast forward three and a half weeks later, I'm in the toughest game I've ever coached up until that time and since. The gold medal game against Spain and Beijing. I get, get shells. It was like one of those amazing moments. And Spain has the assault. They're great. We're beating them. They come back. It's a two-point lead for us with eight minutes to go. And there's a timeout. I go to the, I'm at the bench and I'm getting ready to draw up a play. Hopefully that will work. And as I'm drawing up the play, the hand of the guy I held accountable put his hand on mine, Kobe Bryant. And he looks at me and he says, Coach, we don't need a play. We're ready for this. This is what we prepared, prepared for. And as he spoke, then LeBron James said something. Wayne Wade said something. Carmelo Anthony said something. All of a sudden, the timeout's over. We're leaving the bench without a play. Now, that may have worked or not worked. But I lied to you. There's one more game. You know, we left the bench with the fourth A. We left with a winning attitude. And what happened, instead of running one play, we made play after play after play. And we won the gold medal. Agility, adaptability, accountability ends up where you have a winning attitude in whatever environment you're in. Now, as a leader, what about that thing, that environment thing? You know, how do you how do you develop? Now, for me, I do things with what I call standards. Standards are a way you do things all the time and you require each other to do it all the time. It's a way of living, okay? I don't believe in rules. I went to West Point, they had a regulation book like that. You can never own a rule. You either obey it or disobey it. It doesn't become yours. It, it becomes an obey or disobey type of thing. And so standard though, you can own it. You can own it. Same thing with values, standards and values. That's what helps keep the train moving in the, in, the right, in the right way. And so with my Olympic teams, and even with my Duke teams, the first day I would meet with them, uh, by the way, whenever I had a meeting with my team, I always had a meeting before my meeting with one, two, or three people where I could sense the mood of what the team is feeling. I didn't want to wait till the meeting to find out, whoa, I wish I would have known that. Also to get participation. So our first meeting with the 2008 uh, Olympic team, and these are all studs, 12 guys, great players. I met with four of them individually the afternoon. Jason Kidd, he's the coach of the Mavericks right now. Kobe, Bryant, LeBron James, and Dwayne Wade. And I said, Tonight we're going to have our first team meeting. And they said, yeah, we're going to dis discuss offense and defense. I said, you know, we're not going to discuss offense and defense. I said, well, what are we going to discuss? I said, we're going to discuss how we're going to live. How are we going to live together? And so they, I said, so standards. I said, my two standards my whole life have been the first two. Uh, when we talk to each other, we look each other in the eye. The second standard is we always tell each other the truth. In the moment, it needs to be told. In your business, my business, we can't wait for some one person to have the truth, but the rest of the team doesn't have the truth. No, no, come on. <coughs> Dish it out, man. We need to know the truth right, right now. You can deal with that in that environment. So that night comes. And I'm meeting with them, and we uh, we always had a picture of the gold medal up in our meeting room. And so uh, when they came in, they had big egos. And you hear that expression, 
leave your egos at the door. I don't believe in it. I, when you come in my door, I want you to be you, not less of who you are. And so I said, bring your egos in. By the way, Kobe and LeBron would have brought them in anyway. So they, you know, they, they, you know, they would have brought them in anyway. But I said, bring your egos in. And I said, obviously I'm wearing a USA shirt. I said, let's put all those egos under an ego umbrella, the USA. And if we do that, We'll cover the world. We'll handle handle everything. And during that meeting, uh, I said, you know, uh, I said, I want, and I pointed to each of them. I said, you guys are not playing for the United States. And they looked at me like, you, you an idiot? Why are we here? We're, that's what we're supposed to do. And I said, we won't win that gold medal unless you are United States basketball. Big difference, working for and owning it. And so in all the fewer teams, do people work for you or do they own it? And so what there has to be is common ground. Obviously everybody has different positions and whatever, and everyone's important. That's one of our values, respect, okay? Everybody's important. And, and so we start the meeting, I tell them, look each other in the eye, tell each other the truth. And it's a moment of truth for me, because these guys usually don't volunteer. So I said, what about you guys? And Jason Kidd raises his hand, and inside I'm saying, oh my God, we got one of them, we got one of them. And Jay Kidd says, coach, we should respect each other and be on time. Everybody's on time all the time. And I said, what do you guys think? And he said, yeah, yeah. And I said, so that's one of our, sounds like a rule, doesn't it? Now it's become a standard. And, and I said, speaking of respect, you know, we've lost four of our last five major competitions. We haven't practiced well. We haven't prepared well, okay? Uh, we can't have a bad practice. And it's not my practice. It's our practice, and I told them, for us to be the best of who we can be, we have to be a team of plural pronouns. It can't be, I did this, you did this. It's gotta be about us and our. And if it's about us and our, where we all own it, damn, we're gonna be really good. We're gonna be really good. And so we go through, and we come up with 15 standards, what Dwayne Wade said, we have to have each other's back. It's a good stand, take care of one another. So I said, I can't, I can't do this, but yeah. I said, so if you're gonna sprint this way, you're not looking back, you take a full step and you expect everybody to be with you. If you don't have each other's back, you're doing this all the time. A lot of companies, a lot of places do that. I wonder, no, don't wonder. I got your back, let's go, okay? Kobe Bryant said, if we play defense and rebound, we'll kick everyone's butt. Now, everybody was looking to him because he was, we had a lot of alpha dogs, but he was the biggest alpha dog. And so, sometimes on, on your team, the person who is that for your team needs to step forward and say, I'll do some of the dirty work. Now, it's our work. It's not your work. Oh. We're being selfish. And part of it is being, another was being unselfish, having poise, okay? Never showing weakness. These are all really good things. And so I get 14 standards and I'm feeling like, man, you know, I'm gonna, actually I should go to Vegas right now, I might hit something. And, uh, and uh, but LeBron hasn't said anything, so I'm okay with it though. I said, you know, I don't know if he's punking me or whatever. And, uh, but I'm okay, I got four, are you kidding me? You know, and then all of a sudden he raises his hand and he says, coach, I've dreamed of, I've dreamed of winning the gold medal. Uh, I've dreamed of playing with Kobe and uh, Carmelo and Dwayne and Chris Paul and all these guys. And he's eloquent for two minutes and he said, all you guys, no excuses. 
I never want to hear an excuse. All I want to hear is what the situation is and the solution. Crazy good, right? Come on. Come on, man. If you have that, if you have that, man, you can handle just about anything. And, and so that became our first standard of no excuses. And we, we developed an environment and we also added values. With my Duke team, we had seven values. Uh, integrity, you know what's right, do what's right. Uh, respect, everyone's important. Know everyone's name. Know who Celestina is. You know, she's the, the lady who cleans all of our offices. My mom never went to high school. Uh, she's a cleaning lady in Chicago. Best person in my life. Celestina must be a pretty good person. You know, know everybody's name, say please and thank you, and don't be an idiot with anybody. Treat everybody where when they come, they have respect. The courage, to, the third one is the courage to say or do what needs to be said or done in the moment it needs to be said or done. And selfless service, loyalty, okay? Duty, come to work every day. Do your job, man. Do your job. Do your job. And trust, where we trust one another. Now, uh, that environment is a great environment. So, you create an environment that's conducive to winning. Now, the outside environment doesn't always agree with that. Right? Those interests, or whatever the heck it is. They don't, they don't, agree, they don't agree with it. So, what happens when stuff happens okay i'll tell you a couple stories in my career uh, uh, at coaching duke and they both ended up national championship teams in 2001 uh, we had an outstanding team uh, shane battier mike dunleavy jason williams carlos Boozer, really good and we're playing our last game at home in late february and our starting center our big guy carlos Boozer breaks his foot, okay, and we lose, you know, I talk to the team, I go back, and as a leader, there are moments where, okay, why is this happening to me, you get mad, I have a little bit of a temper, every once in a while I might throw something, not at anybody, but and just yell, like, ah, why is this happening, how could this happen to me, as I matured, my, my, my wife says, keep working on it, by the way. Uh, as I matured, as, and I became a really good coach, I said, you know, the longer I stay in that mode, the worse it's going to be. So I came up with a four-step process for me. I would have a meeting with myself, and I'd just say, hey, knucklehead. Do you believe in you? And I'd look up in a mirror and say, damn right, I believe in me. Do you believe in your team? Damn right, I believe in my team. It's just me now. I know there's probably a psychiatrist out there. I'll set up an appointment later, all right? And, and so I have belief again. I'm getting past that bull crap, all right? And the second thing, and this is something we all have control over. God gave us, to everybody, uh, the ability to have a great attitude. Nobody stops you except you. Nobody stops you except you from having a great attitude. And so, I got a great attitude now. I got a great attitude. Now, we go to the third thing. Why did this happen? What are we going to do? It's called preparation, change, agility, or whatever. And the fourth step is execution. It's a great process. And a lot of times, the thing that you were yelling about here, going through that, is an opportunity. Or it creates a winning environment for the environment that you're in. You have control over that. You can do that. You can, in fact, you have to do it. 
You're the leader. Come on, man. You can't sit there and wallow around in your self-pity and whatever. You gotta get, get moving. So when Booster broke his foot, I did my thing, did this, and the next morning, a real early morning uh, meeting I had with my team, I brought them all in. And they were down, because not everyone says they can't win the national championship. You know, the season's over, basically, for what, for what they're gonna do. So I looked at them and, and I said, I want you to know that I believe in you. Look, I love you is really three good words, especially if you mean it. Uh, said sometimes when you don't mean it. Uh, but the four most powerful words, I think, are you look in someone's eyes and say, I believe in you. You believe in me? I do. We can do this. You can do it and I can do it. It's powerful. Powerful. Okay? And I said, look, we have to have a great attitude. You've had a great attitude up to now. Why wouldn't we have a great attitude now? But then the third step of making adjustments, Boozer's not playing. I now have to implement an entirely new offense with only one month left in the season. We have two guys taking his place who are not Boozer, but they can run like crazy. And so we ended up speeding our system up. And one of the guys who started every game for me, Nate James, he was one of my captains, I said, I'm not going to start you going, going for it. But, you know, your role is the same. And I, I have to start a freshman named Chris Duma because he's lightning fast. Okay? And we need to be lightning fast. After that meeting, without me saying anything to Nate James, but our environment is so good, I see Nate James with his arm around Chris Duhon in the locker room, telling him, I got your back, man. I'm a, so he wouldn't be worried about that. We end up going forward, and we win every game. And we're playing in the national championship game. And by that time, Booser started to play. But he didn't start in the national championship game that year against Arizona. And Casey Sanders did. And so, but at halftime, I knew in order to win, Boozer had to play. Instead of just inserting Boozer in front of the whole team, I looked at Casey and I said, Casey, uh, I need to start Carlos in the second half. Are you okay, man? Are you okay? Like, you've been great. He says, Coach, I'm okay. Instead of, also, don't put doubts, like just, Put it out on the line. And so Booster starts and we win. Handling adversity. Uh, in 2015, our last national championship, uh, we had a really good team. And at semester, one of my good players transferred. And at the end of January, a, a kid had some problems and I had to dismiss him. And so now, I only had eight guys who could play. And, uh, so again, they're not sure if they can win or whatever. I have a meeting with them. I said, listen, you guys, we're gonna win the national championship. Said, right, no, but no, we're gonna win the national championship. I said, I wanna show you something. And on a board, I said, numbers are crazy, are crazy. Look, number one, it doesn't do anything, it's a one. You know, two, what the hell is two doing? Really, four, it's got things going. This way. Six, again, what, what's it doing? And nine is six drunk, you know? It just, you know, I said, we have eight of you. Eight of you. I put the number eight on there. I said, eight will be enough. And I said, you know, we can be a team. And I said, by the way, eight is so beautiful that when you turn it sideways, becomes a sign of infinity. That's who we're going to be. We cannot, we're going to be locked together. And they had all of them stand up and form a circle, and we locked arms. And we said, no weak links. Eight is enough. And I said, one, two, three, and we held out, together! Together, 
we can do this. And we ended up being in the national championship game, playing Wisconsin. We're getting beat by Wisconsin. So those things happen outside, okay? Something can happen while you're competing. And so we're losing. And I put in my eighth man, Grayson Allen. He now starts for the Phoenix Suns. And he's 18 years old, and at times did not play during that season. But we respected him, developed him, he was part of what we were, what we were doing. And by the end of the year, he was playing well. So I put him in, we're down, and he hits two shots. And I look good, you know, I didn't call him play. By the way, good players make you look good, so all right. And, uh, and so we're moving, but then he comes up with a play. Now he's the eighth man on our team, he's 18 years old. And there's a loose ball, this is a free throw line. There's another free throw line on the other side of the court. And there's a loose ball, and I'm not gonna dive because one of my hips will hit out there, and I'm not sure if Ryan has health insurance uh, for you. But uh, the ball's going, he gets fouled, and he goes, and he dives, he's such a great athlete. Gets the ball, and he jumps up. And as he jumps up, there's 73,000 people in the stands and over 30 million people watching the game. This kid is 18 years old and the eighth man on our team. And he gets up and he yells, let's go! Three seconds later, he feels it again. He has the courage to say what needs to be said in the moment. And he says again, let's go! It's like a lightning bolt. I became a better coach. Joel Okafor was better inside. Tyus Jones was a better point guard. Justice Winslow was better. We all got better. We all got better. All right? And we won the national championship. That night, my wife Mickey and I were together. And I said, and we have a really good relationship. And, uh, and I said, Nikki, I can't believe it. We won the national championship because of one of our values, you know, courage. Grayson had the courage to do this. I said, I can't believe it. I, I, I said, I didn't have to draw up a play. And she, she interrupted and she says, well, why didn't you? I said, take, take it easy, hot shot. You know, let me tell my, let me tell my story. All right. And uh, I said, we won because he, he says he had, he had the courage to, you know, to do this. It's the greatest thing. And then she says, no, it isn't. And by the way, all the guys in the audience, when that happens, don't say anything. All right. Pause. Because the next thing you say, well, next, just be careful. Just be careful. And so... So I wait the allotted amount of time, and then the ladies in the audience, you'll know your guys do this a lot. Uh, we do beggar hands, and we said, well, okay, what was better, right? You, you've seen this before, right? What was better? And she says to me, she said, well, obviously, it was because everyone listened. She's right, you know, she's right. We won because two of our values, that respect and courage, and we won the national championship. So as you leave this conference, it's the biggest one ever, I know you've learned a lot, but be adaptable and agile leaders who hold your teams accountable. Develop a winning attitude, and more than that, more, even more than that, add to it, be in control over your environment. Develop one where it's everybody's. And then be able to adapt to that outside environment. You may have to adapt in what you do, but you won't have to adapt in why you do it. The standards and the values will be the foundation upon which you can handle 
the new thing that you have to have to do. And so as you leave here today, actually I was gonna play the piano and sing, but a lot of you guys are going to uh, Billy Joel's concert, so I would have looked bad, really bad in comparison. Uh, some of you are going home. Leave here, leave here with a sense of excitement about what you did for the last three days, keeping that uh, mutual respect with Daikama, uh, the, the trust and whatever, and go and win. Go and win, and win together. As you leave here, before you leave my locker room, I'll say one more thing. Let's go! All right, thank you very much. seconds left, down boy by a point. I can't let you leave. What was the thought process? The whole thing. So, because Brian's not big, assuming that you all know what the hell he's talking about. Yeah, a lot of people uh, don't. Uh, uh, we're the, we're, we had won a national title in 91. We're the number one team in the country. And we're playing the Elite Eight. If we win, we go to the Final Four. We're playing Rick Latino's Kentucky team. They're terrific. And we're up by one, and they hit a shot, a bank shot, to go up by one point. And at that time, the clock didn't stop. So our team called a timeout with 2.1 seconds. So we had the ball on that baseline. We have the score here. So as a leader, one thing I was taught by, uh, as an officer is to always show a strong face and to try to speak into action what you want to have happened. So, look, I'm a human being. When he hits the shot, I said, we're gonna lose. You know, I mean, how the hell are we gonna win right now? And I said, okay, so the team's coming. I need them as they're coming. I just start saying, we're gonna win. We're gonna win. I'm looking in their eyes. And I'm, but I'm self-talking too. And the leader self-talks when they're talking to uh, his or her team. They get to the match. And we have a thing, look at each other's eyes and tell each other. So I look at Grand Hill and I said, can you take the ball out of bounds? Can you throw it 75 feet? The court's 94 feet. And, 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 I, and I said, can you do it? He says, coach, I can do it. A lot of times in these situations, it's better not just to tell somebody what to do, but ask them if they can do it. It's, it's a powerful thing. Grant will tell you, as soon as he said that, he felt, well, I can do this. I gave my word I could do it. And we draw up a play where Christian Layman, who's the college player of the year, said, he's going to come up to the foul line. We're going to try to hit him with a long pass. So I say to Christian, and Christian was an arrogant winner. <laughs> he was not afraid of any situation. And um, so I said, if I bring you up, you know, you like when you can you catch the ball and then you gotta do something with it. And he looks at the team, he said, Coach, if Grant throws a good pass, I'll catch the big ball. All of a sudden, I start feeling like, you know, we might win. We might win. These guys are doing it. And he threw it. Christian caught it. He dribbled, which my heart fell. And and, and he turned and he hit the shot. And we won. And that was we ended up then winning the national championship two games, two games later. And uh, it's all the principles I just talked about, you know, and where guys are believing in themselves. You ask questions, you make sure it's theirs. And there's obviously a little luck involved, you know, but uh, most of it's preparation. Most of it. They didn't have in 1992 all the cyber metrics. And if that game happened today, there would be a statistic on the bottom of the screen saying win probability, Kentucky 99.9 to 0.1%. I'm sure something like that would be displayed on the bottom of the screen. You know what, though? I would say this. Uh, my whole life, I always 
thought I was supposed to win. And then, why would you think you're supposed to lose? And but then I, would, I was taught by my mom, with an eighth grade education, the dignity of work. The dignity, and I grew up in a good Polish household. And uh, by the way, my mom only went to eighth grade for the last 18 years, we have a nonprofit in Europe called the Emily Szczewski Center. That's my mom. And we service about 1,800 kids. They're all low income kids, a lot of first generation. Kids, low income kids, only about one in five get a chance to go to college. It's one of the biggest, maybe the biggest untapped resource in our country today is the talent that's available in low income areas. And so, it, this has been a huge success. Our, we had 26 kids go to college this year. Three of them are going to Duke. Are you kidding me? One's going to Harvard, okay? One's going to Penn. Four of them are going to the University of North Carolina, a great school, and it's really difficult to get in there, you know, and, uh, because it's such a good, good school. And so what I'm saying is, everybody's important, everybody should be given a chance, and everybody should feel like they're part of the team. And uh, so I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, I did my thing, I do a lot of speaking, but I did things different today because we had good content calls. And last night, I called this joker over here about 10 15, 10 30. I said, Brian, I just got my wrong. I'm ready to go to bed. I said, Are you okay? And I started, he says, You know, coach. And 20 minutes later, we're talking, could you add this, could you do this? And, and I said, you know what, you're right, I will, because uh, your group deserves it. And uh, the speakers before me have done a fabulous job of talking about all, all these things. And, uh, anyway, thank you for your attention. Godspeed. <laughs>